You're listening to Gender, A Wider Lens. I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Since 2016, my practice has been exclusively dedicated to gender questioning teens and families impacted by gender dysphoria. I also work with gender questioning teenagers and I facilitated support meetings for families and individuals who have been impacted by gender issues. We're curious about the concept of gender and how it's unfolding in the wider culture. Join us as we look at gender through a wider lens. Hello, Stella. Hi there. How are you? I'm great. So we are back to continue discussing what depth therapy looks like when you're in kind of the the main segment of our therapy sessions with clients. We did our first episode last week of this section here, and we realized that we could probably just do these kinds of episodes for years and years to come. So happily. We, we, yeah, <laughs> happily. Um, so we're going to just continue discussing what kinds of topics, themes, techniques, and conversations happen when we are doing depth work with a person around gender issues. Um, so where, where do we want to get started, Stella? I suppose when I think about how to work with a gender questioning youth, I think generally, I, I think, you know, the, the, the seeking to transition is a solution and it's a solution to pain. There's a, you know what I mean? That they are seeking to get away from their mental and inner pain on one level or another. And I'm very interested in trying to cultivate some joy and some, some happiness within them so that like whatever they do, whether they end up transitioning or not, that they they have learned how to be happy off their own steam without always thinking that there's this, there's something so alluring about there's a pill I can take. It's going to change me. I'm going to be a new person and that person will be happy. And I think it comes from a place of much more empowerment. If it's I'm happy and I'm going to choose to transition because I think that's the road uh, that would be happier. If you follow me, that's a free choice as opposed to I'm in desperate pain. And I'm going to transition in an almost desperate kind of choice of this might make me better. I don't think that's a a good place to take any big decision. So, yeah, cultivating a sense of joy in the client. And that's by me asking each week, well, what did you do to kind of bring some joy into your life? What does bring joy into your life? What are the little things? Because sometimes they're like, no, nothing, nothing. Nothing, nothing makes me happy. Everything is awful. And I, I kind of slowly and probably tediously for the client said, well, let's go through it all <laughs> in the morning. What's the morning <laughs> like? And honestly, when I meet these kids so, so often, they tell me their lives and I think that is pretty difficult. It's grim. It's hard. It's boring. It's performative. It's competitive. It's tense. It's, 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 it's deadening in a lot of ways. And any of the laughs are kind of kind of private on their own kind of laughs. There isn't there isn't too much having a laugh with your mates. Generally, when they're with their mates, they're in they're in so much anxiety that any laughs they could be having aren't being had. So I find it's a very joyless existence and I, 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 I my heart bleeds for them. Yeah, so that's a big one for me. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And for me, when I think broadly about the kids that I've worked with and which kids am I really worried about and which kids am I less worried about, it has way less to do with where they stand specifically on gender, though that can become kind of an outcome of how they're doing, but way more to do with generally does their life have joy in it. I think that's really key. And what I've noticed is that The more joy in general that a child is able to feel in their life, the less fixed they are about whether or not gender is this magic solution. And that doesn't necessarily mean that kids who have a lot of joy will never choose to transition, because they might. But it is the fact that, you know, we know that when we're in a heightened state emotionally, a state full of anxiety or fear or anger, 
we are not able to think very clearly. We're not able to put things in perspective. It's much harder to function on a day to day. And therefore it's really hard to make you know, sound healthy decisions about our bodies when we're in a desperate state, like you were alluding to. So I think this is really key. And when it comes to expressions of joy, this, this idea I think permeates sometimes in our culture, especially in youth culture, that there's some kind of a stable state of happiness that exists all the time. And kids think, I'll reach that once I do X, you know, even aside from gender dysphoria, a lot of young people feel like, if only my mom would buy me these shoes, (laughs) or if only I was friends with this person, or, and there's this idea that you'll reach some kind of state where you've, you've gotten to that happiness level, and then you coast. And the truth is, that's not, that's not exactly how it goes. What I try to do with clients is actually recognize moments of joy even in the context of our therapy. So for example, if I'm having a conversation with a client and they're telling me about a new play that they're working on in theater or some band that they listen to and I notice that they're getting very enthusiastic and they're starting to talk faster and become expressive with their face, I'll say, you know, have you noticed right now as you've been describing that play to me or this band to me, you seem really authentic. That's what it means, I think, to be authentic. Because when you're able to you know, express the joy that is coming up from you, from your core, and that's how you know you're on the right track. You know, if you feel like you can clearly and freely you know, share with another person the ex- experience you're having, that tells us that we're on the right track. Yeah. And, you know, being authentic also is it's kind of embodying the moment. So they're in the moment telling you something and they're just there. They're not thinking there's nothing in the back of their head. There isn't a voice kind of saying kind of nasty things. They're just telling you about film because it's so exciting. Yeah. And that's authenticity. And that is another issue that I like to explore within the kind of therapeutic sense is what is your authentic self? Let's let's just talk about authenticity as a concept. And I believe authenticity is, is, is such a liberating feeling when you are authentic, but to chase it is such a, that's a mind boggler. You're chasing it. And I think I did chase it as a kid. Like, a, you know, I'm, I, I was trying to be really <laughs> authentic. And now I'm just naturally authentic because I've fallen in with myself, if you follow me. But I think it's a really derailing concept to chase and I think that's what the that's the chase of of transition is my authentic self and I think an awful lot of teenagers have been chasing their authentic self which is kind of sad because as we said in another episode you know the idea of of adolescence is to check out lots of different authentic selves and you will emerge like a butterfly from these with yourself with you know with your with your way of being And yeah, I like to kind of go into the philosophy of who am I? Where does that come from? Is there one true self? Is there many true selves? Is the person I was when I was 15 different or similar? So I like to get quite into what the philosophers have been saying over thousands of years, maybe like John Locke or Plato, and kind of have them kind of think about this and realize there's many, many geniuses before us who have been chasing that. And it's a very satisfying uh, intellectual pursuit, but it's not a new one. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great because it, it, it the nature of the adolescent struggle, particularly with isolation and feeling alone, is that you don't really think anybody else has ever felt the way that you do. And in fact, the entire process of adolescence is this very bumpy road in which kids are supposed to figure out who they are. And so... You know, you and I were talking a bit about how these young people tend to be incredibly intelligent. They're usually uh, very academically oriented and perfectionistic and very, very deep thinkers in some ways. And I think they need help connecting the fact that these are not new questions. You know, when you put the label gender dysphoria on top of something, it feels very novel and new, and it feels um, like that word 
disguises some of the more universal kind of drivers behind this exploration, which is, I feel different from others. I feel out of place in my body. I don't know where I fit in the world. I'm uncomfortable with these changes. I don't like how others see me. And if we held that in a more light touch, we'd realize, oh, these are really old questions. There's been Mm. literature and music and books and paintings created about these questions for the history of mankind. So I think it's really helpful to, you know, work with clients on recognizing, oh, I know this question. This question shows up in a lot of different ways. Let's not get, you know, sidetracked by the specifics right here. This is a very old question, and that's really important for clients to understand. I think that is, yeah, a really good point. I think, you know, novels like The Catcher in the Rye, I remember reading it as a kid, and it had such an impact on me. It was like, whoa, oh my God, he's me. And I'm him. And like he was was so random because he was so not like me and vice versa. And yet, evidently, there was an alienation there that I connected with and that he was. And then the bell jar, another one that really, you know, hit me. But then there's even films like Taxi Driver and stuff like that that show that sense of alienation. I just think it's really important that kids, teenagers go into the literature and the art and the films to realise like that's where you meet your, your, that's where you get your sense of set. There's something about music. There's something about seeing somebody else's art and it hits you in a place. And I think that has more value than is appreciated often these days. And I think, I just think it's really important. And I I feel now you you have me, you, you have a more extensive experience than I have. And you've definitely met more adolescents who have, engaged in these artistic pursuits I've had little little joy in in it and I I you know like I sound like an old codger say no but I just won't read the great books but I find they're not massively interested in the books or even remember that book Into the Wild did you read that John Krakauer I, I think his name was no. it's a sad 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 book um it's more new I'd say it's in the last 20 years um, he, he he went into the wild. He's in America and he wanted to live in, in the wild, but he was actually only oh, a few yeah. miles from mm-hmm. the road and he died in his attempt to live a self-sufficient life. It's very sad. Um, but it was I think very, I saw the movie. You I did, think I did. Probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and the movie is very good too. You know, any of those, but like even Albert Camus and Le Tranger, The Stranger, way back in the 1940s, there's so many books and films and especially... There is music, I'd say, you know, and um, an awful lot of the Curehead kind of times in the 1980s would have been alienation. But I really think that builds a depth and not only a depth, it builds connectivity with the human race. There's something about it. And I, I think it's essential. But I have to say as a caveat, I haven't been madly successful. I think you have been. Is that right? Well, I mean... I- I I have worked with kids who are going to really excellent schools that are teaching some of this kind of classic literature and with with good teachers who help them dig into these questions. But, you know, I have to say, because I think these are existential human problems, there are contemporary ways in pop culture that I think these show up to. So, I mean, I know that I've talked with clients about you know, some indie rap group or something. And when I say, oh, what's your favorite song? Or ask the client to share with me, what, what are the lyrics? Do you remember? And you'll realize like, oh, these, these new artists in their own way are also grappling with these questions and also expressing this. So I think it keeps showing up in slightly oh, different does. ways. Yeah, it does. There's no doubt about it. But the classics are classics because they, they went that little bit further. And that's like, you know what I mean? There was no way any of the books that I've referenced were from my era. They were classics that had gone into the classical literature because of that. And I think there's a, a kind of a, we, we gloried in youth in the last 50 years to an extent that now there's a, there's a throwing out of, of the old wisdom 
And so there's a kind of a presumption that like as it's, you know, if I say Catcher in the Rye, it's certainly not from my era. The Belgia are certainly not from my era or <laughs> Les Tranger. None of them are from my era. But there was a, a respect given to classics that just isn't. It's kind of presumed to be old fashioned equals a bit bad. Yeah, no, I, I totally I think get we're that. we're losing something. I think we're losing really frightening kind of depth with that. And I know this is so slaggable, by the way, everybody who's laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you're right. But I mean, to go back to, to how this shows up in therapy, you know, sometimes I will uh, kind of joke with a client and they'll, they'll be talking about something. And of course, I always start by empathizing and really hearing them and reflecting what they're saying. And sometimes I'll say, guess what? You're not the first person to ask this question for the history of time. We've had tragic yeah. stories and songs and poems and music and art written about this exact difficult thing. And I think, you know, sometimes clients will laugh and they'll go, yeah, I guess. And I think it's just important, even if they're not reading the classics themselves, just to tie in that sense of perspective that this is a human problem. Yeah. And it's really hard to solve. Otherwise, we would have all solved it by now. And there wouldn't be, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of thinking about this. Like, look, at you know that amazing uh, picture, the scream from that oh, guy? Up yes. Oh, yes. Oh, Jesus, yes. there's alienation for you. And, you know, like Vincent van Gogh, if, or I think you say Van Gogh in America, do you? Or van Gogh, I don't know. Yeah, Van Gogh. Um, is it? Um, yeah, like his pictures, Wow. They, they go into a really extraordinary place. But I think keying in with the alienation is the sense of being different. And that would be something I really go there with clients. It's like, let's throw that dead dog on the table now. Yeah. yeah. What's it like being different? Because I think it's really difficult to be different as a kid. And actually, it can be quite OK as an adult. When you find your tribe, when you find yourself, it's OK to be different as an adult isn't as awful as it is to be a kid, but it's very hard to be different as a kid. So I like to declare it. It's like you seem a bit dif different. And I, I see relief that they're like, yes, I'm out of sync. I'm not in the same place as my mates. I'm, I'm not in a long, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the same place as them. I'm different and I feel alone and I'm lonely. And I think I'm the only person who feels like this. And there's something really powerful when that gets explored. That's so important. And, and I think, you know, this is bringing to mind that sometimes the term gender dysphoria acts as a stand-in for other things. And, you know, when I think about feeling different just broadly in my own life, times when I have really realized my differentness, let's say, yeah. it's when I'm really embarrassed or when I'm standing out in a way that is not positive. You know, you just feel your differentness in those moments. Sometimes when I explore with a client, you know, what are the triggers for your gender dysphoria, for example, and we really, really go deep examining every single word that they're saying and what that actually means, sometimes we, we conclude together that, you know, sometimes gender dysphoria sounds like feeling embarrassed, you yeah. know, or like being called out or suddenly feeling incredibly like you stick out like a sore thumb. Sometimes that's what they mean by gender dysphoria, right? And so I think you're, you're completely spot on in recognizing that this, this sense of feeling different is a big part of the picture for some of these kids. I don't wonder where all that's from. See that, what you're talking about there? It's a sense of shame about who you are or something. And it reminds me of what we've spoken about before. We spoke about it with Artie Morty as well. The, the kind of the sexual development of a person is an incredibly vulnerable kind of process, more so than anything else. And I think, I think what we're circling around here with shame and gender dysphoria, and I think you're right, I think there is something really key to what you're saying but I think there's a sense of shame when your your sexual self is developed. I even seen it with my children when they, you know, the, the, the as they get older and they become more private, it's almost instinctive an animal, if you follow me. And is is that an, a biological instinct to remain to go private? 
And is the, is what is that sense of shame around our bodies when our bodies start changing? And is that where gender dysphoria is rooted for some of these children? Is it to do with this, an emerging sexual self that is connected with shame that turns into a gender dysphoria? Is it all a kind of a, a mangling of that? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that, you know, in, in the cultural discourses around these issues, there are many, many components as to why a young person who's developing might feel shame around sexuality and their body. I mean, we cannot dismiss the role of some social influences that are really shaming, like certain kinds of pornography that kids might see or certain bullying and harassment interactions with other kids. I mean, I think those are really powerful. And also, I, I, I don't feel convinced that in the absence of those things that we could all develop sexuality in an easy, breezy, no problem kind of way. I mean, you go from having a child body completely flat and not much going on to all of a sudden your body is developing, parts are sprouting, <laughs> and you start to see things change that signal an adult looking kind of body. I mean, when hair grows on the body, this is all of a sudden, you really cannot pretend to be a child child anymore. So I think that some degree of self-consciousness comes with the territory of development. Um, and, and I have to say, you know, thinking about sexuality, there's a lot that, that, is done in, in our therapy work that I have with clients around the confusion some kids have around same-sex attraction. I mean, I can't, I can't really begin to <laughs> explain how important it is for therapists to really slow down if a child is expressing same-sex attraction. You have to understand how confusing that can feel and how necessary it is to work for a long time on normalizing that. Because young people tend to think, well, I have progressive attitudes, I support gay people, therefore it's impossible that I have internalized homophobia. But that's not true. You can hold a certain attitude towards others and still feel a lot of ambivalence and shame about what's coming up in your own sexual development. Yeah, I think you're so right. And I, I, I've been kind of surprised over the years working with clients because I bought it. I bought the idea that we're all LGBT and we all get it. And actually, it's all positive, and positive sex movement. And then you meet somebody who's, who's uh, you know, a 14 year old with a burgeoning same sex attraction. And it is not happy clappy. They've internalized homophobia. They do not want to be gay or lesbian, who are, whatever they are. And they are fighting against it. And, and they are fine for everybody else. Not for me, is their thing. You, you, you know what I mean? And it's, it, they, they suppress it. And it comes out in, in other ways. And they deny it. They deny themselves. They become very harsh and critical about it. They, they're shame-based. They're, they're mortified about it. And I don't know what we're going to do because we put a massive amount of effort into releasing people from their shame with this. And it, it still seems to be so strong. And even like to this day, I hear of homophobic bullying regularly in schools, regularly. I, I've written a book about bullying. And so I hear more about bullying than most people. And oh my God, Homophobic bullying in teenage schools, is, it's, it's just unbelievably rampant. And I feel like, are we back in the 70s here? Like, is this seriously? We're going all this woo, woo, woo and wrapping ourselves around flags. And then suddenly this is really quite deep in the society. It's, it's just shocking. I think there is like a, there's a disconnect because, you know, some of the schools that I'm familiar with, are in these incredibly progressive neighborhoods and progressive parents and very inclusive curriculum. And in those schools, you know, what I see, it's really interesting. Like all the, a lot of kids will call themselves gay and lesbian yeah. and it's a label. Yeah. 
Yeah. But when you actually dig down into a young person's experiences with their own arousal and sexuality, that's a different story. It's one thing to just proudly say, you know, I'm so gay, I'm part of the GSA, this and that. And it's a very different thing to like be comfortable with the visceral and physical experiences you're having. And on the other hand, there are some schools, like you said, Stella, that seem like a snapshot out of, you know, the 1950s with how incredibly homophobic and you know, frankly, awful some of the kids can be. And of course, there's a, a, a variety in between of those two spectrums. But it's really a confusing place for kids. And so to, to kind of go back to the therapy, this is something that clients and I will spend a lot of time on. And really picking through their attitudes and their experiences and what accompanying emotions come along with their arousal. And we touched a little bit on this last time. You were saying, you know, we don't know how to deal with teenage burgeoning sexuality as a culture, and it's, it's something very important to address in therapy over time. I mean, these things are evolving, but it's tough and it's important to work on, and you can't really just take a young person's progressive attitudes as some kind of an indicator of how they are really dealing with their own sense of sexuality and whether there's shame there or things to work through. Yeah. And there's, you know what you were saying earlier about, you know, their bodies are growing and their their hair is coming and there's something so animal-like about hair in this civilized, yeah. sophisticated, sophisticated society. And these kids are sophisticated. They are as disconnected from the body as you could be in many ways. They're digital. They're digital kids. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And there's a digital generation. And that hair blood thing feels very far from where they're at. They're on screens where it's synthesized and it's clean and you make your avatars and it's 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 very disconnected from the animalness of our bodies. And I think they are really quite disconnected. But I do want to talk about breasts because I think when you're growing, you know, you, you've got hair under your arms or whatever and your, your privates are growing. But for girls in particular, and the obsession around breasts to do with gender is extraordinary, the amount of emphasis around breasts. But breasts are like front and centre. There they are, right in front. Everybody can see whether you're big or small or you're growing or whether you're young or early. There's nothing private about breasts. They are there to be seen, to be judged, to be looked at. And um, they are judged and looked at and commented upon and grabbed and groped and um, they are just so kind of obvious if you follow me they are literally front and center of the person's body and I think that's really hard in a world where sex has become so pornified that I can see where the the binding movement came from it's like get these objects off me because they are sexual objects and they're upon me and so I, I can really see where that came from. Well, this, this is important to tie in because this becomes a big component of my work. But there is a digital component, too, of how a young woman or young man is developing on in the Snapchat era, in the texting naked pictures era. And so this is a huge complicated issue because um, I know that in very young ages, you know, around 11, 10 and 11 and 12, boys are texting girls asking for naked photos. And and boys are probably being, you know, asked those types of photos perhaps by older people too. So, I mean, all the kids are having some kind of parallel experience of what you and I experienced you know, had when we were teenagers and like, you know, boys snapping your bra or doing these things that are really awful. And it's happening on a digital plane. And then that becomes something everybody could potentially know about. And so we so talk in, in, in therapy, we talk a lot about, yes, absolutely the shame, the permanence of, of those types of decisions. And also how is utilizing social media impacting your overall well-being. I mean, sometimes we we track it. I mean, how spending time on these devices impacts a young person. And it's hard because they don't really have a sense of perspective. Like, I can think back in my life about 
before I was glued to my cell phone 24 hours a day and after I was glued because I was a functioning adult in both scenarios. But these kids don't have any sense of perspective. So, you know, they almost look at you like a deer in headlights when you talk about the impact that these phones have on them because they're, they're like, well, what else is there? They can cognitively understand that their kids, their parents didn't have phones. But, but this is important because the phones have created a totally different layer of complication on top of the adolescent development. So we talk about that in therapy. Yeah. I remember I did a TV program. I was kind of a therapist for the program and the kids were brought to a different location and lived, you know, in a rural lifestyle, for example. And one kid was really addicted to her phone and her phone was taken off her and she was liberated. A couple of days of pining and then liberation. All of them had their phones taken off them. And, you know, some but some of them really said, oh, my God, I've never lived without it. I've never, I don't remember not having a device in my hand. And it was amazing. It was amazing when I realized. Wait, this was a a TV program? I don't want to derail us, but this is fascinating. (laughs) Can we, can we watch it? Like, can people watch this? I'll pick up a link. I'm sure we could. Stella, (laughs) you're so amazing. You're like, oh, by the way, one time I was this, in this television program, just very random. (laughs) Well, wow, yeah. okay. I'll think of a link. I don't know if we'll probably be able to watch it. Actually, some of it is very funny um, and some of it is very touching. And this girl who, who's, who's, who just got liberated from being relieved from her phone. And I think it's our job to relieve them. Like you say, they've no consciousness of living without devices. And the digital lifestyle, it's not only that. Me and you were speaking, they're, they're kind of cocooned within their bedroom. So they go from their bedroom into their, their mother's car visiting their friends and to school and they've no interaction with the physical landscape. It sounds very abstract to be talking about that, but it, it's a real issue that there's a, there's a real feeling of disconnect with the world. And it's, 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 it's very, I just think it's very alienating, funnily enough, and I, I don't think it's good for them. And the better, they'd be better off walking over to their friends. They'd be better off meeting in parks. They'd be better off getting the hell out of their bedrooms and when I'm working with clients I focus a lot on that the the liberation of meeting your friends without your parents being involved you figure it out you get there you figure out where you're going to meet them at what corner you're going to meet them because they live there and you live there and you hang around you meet them and you go where you want to be there's something very um evolving and growing up about that and it's an important rite of passage and they're not doing it they're, they're doing it with in cars and mammies and all that. And I think there's a real issue around childlike, wanting to stay childlike, wanting to stay as a child, to do with gender dysphoria, afraid of growing up in a way, afraid of, of, of losing control and of growing up. And I don't know what, where I'm going with this, but I see it a lot. You know, um, I, I have worked with clients who are kind of doing better on that front, and I think there is a drive to be independent behind that. You know, yeah. I mean, when, when you have a client who, let's say they, they kind of want to sneak out behind their parents' back and meet their friends without their mom knowing, like, even though that's considered to the parent, you know, ex- unacceptable behavior, I read that as there's an appropriate desire to become independent here. And I, I agree with you that these types of interactions in person and peer-mediated interactions are important to have. They're a very important part of the growing up process. Yeah, but I do think that the, the, there's a lot of kids with gender issues that, as you've said before, I think compulsively cl- compliant. And so they're, they're falling in with, with the parents' idea of how they should be, which is generally very good in school, you know what I mean, quite attentive, and uh, often socially it's, it's, it's boring. Their life is boring. And I, th- I really think they could do with a lot more risks and a lot more excitement. It's a, it feels, that's going back to what we started right at the beginning of the episode, which was joy. There's a lack of risk that they need to take. And developmentally, they should be taking risks at that age. And I know parents are uncomfortable with that. And I often, that's where I work with the parents saying they need liberation. They need some risk. They need you, you not to know where they are. And they need to know that their parents don't know where they are. You know, they're 15 years old and they need that sense of I'm on my own now with my friends. They, they need that. 
And in therapy, this becomes really important, this, this distinction between the child in relationship to the parents and the child as a separate individual. And something that I find myself working on a lot with clients is like, how do we help you make decisions about your life that are not necessarily a reaction against your parents and not necessarily just following what your parents tell you to do. Let's help you take a different perspective on all of this because if you go out into the world with the attitude of, mom and dad, you don't believe me, I'm going to show you, then you're not acting in an authentic way. You're You're acting as a response to mom and dad. And on the other hand, I mean, you're not supposed to listen to everything your parents say exactly when you're 19 years old. I mean, you still have to make some independent choices. So I find this is really important. And just to kind of tie in the family piece, you know, I I often tell parents, you have to give your kids another perspective on this gender thing because nobody else is going to do it. But when parents take the position where they're always challenging the child... The kid ends up kind of backed up in a corner where all they can do is defend their position. And when you're in defense mode, you can't actually think in a curious way, and you don't have any space for your own skepticism. So one of the things I'm always thinking about in therapy is, where is this client's skepticism? Because any big decision in your life, even if you're a teenager, cannot possibly make sense to have zero ambivalence about it yeah everything's complicated you know even if it's like oh i want to go out to the mall with so and so um i'm really excited about it and then you dig a little bit further and it's like yeah but also i don't know if we'll see joe there and so i don't know if i want to go so there's no there's no decision that is made with no ambivalence so if a kid comes to session with nothing but confidence and a huge posture about how great this is and how they've never been more certain. I, I just, I know there's more there. And sometimes it's because parents have pushed so hard that the child has to defend their position and cannot ask their own skeptical questions. God, there's so many points I want to make around that. It's so true. And I think we have, um, we society have sold this idea of happiness to kids and so they think happiness is a thing that they should be experiencing. And anybody beyond a certain age would think, oh, no, no, <laughs> that's not how it works out in life. And I suppose what, what they really would be more benefiting from would be a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. That would give a lot more um, um, contentment, and I say that lightly and nervously as a word, but certainly chase and happiness is, is, is a false kind of chase. And I really think that an awful lot of kids are chasing. They think they should be happy. They think the default is happy and they're unusual for not having it. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> like happiness is glimpsed, it's grasped, it comes, it goes. But the day to day challenge of life is I'm a bit hungry, but I won't eat now because if I eat that, because I've been eating too many donuts, but actually I better do that work. Blah, 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 blah. That is life. <laughs> and when, the sooner they learn that, I think that I, I, I know I've said it before, but I, I really think we've given our kids a disnified childhood and they're horrified like a bucket of cold ice water when they come to consciousness, any age from 10 to 15 of, oh my God, it's so far from Disney. It's so difficult. Well, I think kids had harder childhoods before, so they didn't quite come with such a sense of, but if we're all good, we'll all be happy. And I've seen it with my own kids. They honestly think, but the best guy wins if he's just honest and if he's good. And it's like, OK. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? So I, I really think they think that they can chase happiness, that they should be happy. And uh, their sense of unhappiness must have a reason and must be fixed. And somewhere along the way, that turns into gender dysphoria. And it, 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 it's, it's not really, it's been fixated upon with gender as opposed to anything else. But uh, yeah, 
There's, there's one thing you said to me earlier that I thought, oh, my God, I am going to grab that and use that in therapy. You said you do a timeline of gender questioning. Tell me yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not always formal, but I have done like, you know, bring a bunch of paper and crayons to our next meeting. We're going to do this, this activity. But what I try to do is over the course of many, many sessions, and sometimes we weave in and out, is really take a very detailed inventory of this child's onset of gender dysphoria. Sometimes we'll start two years back, you know, when the teenage angst first began. You know, a lot of times the onset for girls is between like 13 and 16, you know. And so what do you, ta- what do, you do if they say, oh, I always gender question, what, I was always, always. No, I mean, there's a lot to explore. So I'll say, okay, interesting. So how did that look when you were 11? Was it exactly the same as now or was it a bit different? Okay. And again, I mean, this is about the relationship. So if I say on the first session ever, you know, we're going to, we're going to question whether you have gender dysphoria and we're going to do a timeline. That's not going to go over well, but, but I'm meeting the client where they're at. And I'm saying, I I fully believe that you're experiencing this. And we're going to, you know, I'm curious to really slow it down. So I've usually kind of taken an informal verbal history at this point. And then I might say, okay, you know, you've shared with me that things have kind of gone like this. I think it'd be interesting to really sit down and look at it together, maybe on a timeline, just to see how all of this developed. And again, it's not always in a formal thing, you know, on paper, but I really kind of return over and over and over to when this, when the gender dysphoria took this current manifestation and how it's evolved. You know, I don't know if you had this experience, Stella, but kids will gladly admit that when they first started reading about gender, they were obsessed with it. And they'll say, you know, yeah, I was kind of like one of those annoying kids on Instagram, you know, making a bunch of social justice claims and neo-pronouns and stuff. But now I have a much more like authentic version of my gender. And and I think that's really valuable, you know, to think about that. So kids will, will admit that at the beginning, it becomes a total obsession Yes. And over time, you know, they maybe stop trying so hard and they stop reading like how to pass as a trans guy. And they just start trying to be more natural about how they present themselves to the world. So that's really interesting and valuable. And, you know, in the, in the course of putting together or discussing this timeline, I always try to assess how things evolve or even in the child's attitude. So... I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, Stella, but but I will ask, you know, what do you think of neo-pronouns like Zir and Zim? You know, what what do you think of that? Because this is kind of a controversial thing in, in the world of trans identity, right? So what do you think? And if you can get the kid talking, usually they themselves do see that there are some holes in this belief system that I don't fully buy, you know, or Or young people who, when they first came out at 15, desperately wanted puberty blockers. And then by the time they are 18 or 19 and they've, you know, their brain has developed a bit, they've learned a lot more, they've seen how activists act online, which they don't feel represents them. They will say, you know, you know, I really wanted that, but I'm glad that my parents didn't give me blockers because... You know, that stuff is, is dangerous. Kids need to grow up. Yeah. So, so what I mean is that there are always very valuable, you know, critical thinking skills that are happening there. If you give it time and you don't get to, you know, you don't, you don't want to attack a child's views, but you have to understand if you're working with a 13-year-old, give it a few years. They're not going to feel exactly the same way when they're 16 as they do now. So you, it's like also a matter of trusting the process and doing these gender timelines really helps to, you know, add some self-awareness to the experience of like, oh yeah, you know, I did think that back then and now I have a different view about it. Yeah. And it could be interesting now, I, I hear you about the gender. I'm definitely going to do that with clients because I think it's a great idea. I've often done a timeline of, you know, their life just generally, you know what I mean? Yeah. And kind of when things became pain, when pain came in, like if you follow me, maybe at eight, my friend did this and at 10 and things like that. And I think it would be very interesting to parallel them 
do, do you follow me and see see what's going on in both? I find very often they're they're very quick um clients are to especially adolescent ones are oh yeah but I'm all over that yeah you know, you know that, that 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 was last year and now I'm 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 through it and I think the kind of the culture of positive health has really kind of seeped into them so they're so quick to say I've processed that yeah it was awful at the time but I'm I'm, I'm over it and I think that speed of of trying to process things fast is it's my job to kind of unpick and slow it down and kind of try to kind of on some level become more reflective and less instant about things. And I, I find a lot of the time I, I dispel a lot of uh, categories. Like I, I don't I don't really go there with the categories and the diagnosis and all those kind of label me this and label me that. And I like to look behind the label. So let's you tell me often, let's say I might say to a client, you tell me often that, you know, that's your autistic traits or that's ADHD. Well, let's look behind. How did that impact? Tell me about you getting diagnosed and when did it first come in? When did you notice it? When, how has it impacted you to have a diagnosis? And just to explore all of the kind of flavours of having had a diagnosis because having a diagnosis shapes people. Well, no matter what the diagnosis yeah. is, it shapes yeah. people. And I like clients to come to a realisation, of, oh, it othered me. I didn't realise it at the time, but it, it, on some level it made me feel different. You know, diagnoses can be containing insofar as maybe they create an explanation for why, which in a way normalizes it. But you're right. I think when they are not held carefully, they can really other a child and then they can create this lens through which the kid sees all their behavior. Um, So I think that's important. I mean, I'd like to touch on something else too. You know, we talked earlier about kids feeling very different. Yeah. And I've also seen, especially with long-term work, clients who have really evolved through kind of different iterations of how gender is showing up in their lives. I've also seen that some kids are really struggling to recognize and accept their ordinariness oh. in some ways too. Yeah. And, and specifically, I mean, I'm thinking about how some young people these days have heard of rapid onset gender dysphoria. And if they come to a place where they actually look into it or read about it, sometimes they'll say at first, you know, well, that's not me at all because these people had this or this mental health issue or this or this thing. And they'll try to find every reason that's not like them. And then sometimes if you have a very self-aware kid, they might say in kind of a moment of despair, like it was weird because I read some of those stories and it did seem like me. And whoa, that's really something. And, you know, I think the the process of therapy is not about making conclusions in the moment. It's about creating the pattern of self-awareness. And over time, if you can help a child or a young person slow down and explore all of the things they bring to therapy carefully and slowly and with interest and return to it over and over, you develop the capacity for self-awareness. And I think it's self-awareness that allows a kid to say, you know, I might have ROGD. I don't know. You know? Yeah. Um, I think you're right. I think if, if, if a child is saying I might have ROGD, they're already quite developed in the self-awareness and I, I I think that should be um, explored within therapy. The concept of ROGD, what it is, how it is. But I find it's something I'm very gentle about bringing in. Very, very, very tentative. Because I really think it's so important to keep that alliance. And because yeah. we're living in a political atmosphere around this, that's what therapy work is being a little bit distorted that I'm nervous to bring in like resistance has been around since Freud do you follow me and yet these days we have to be so careful if we think something's resistant and that's where politics is 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 impinging on therapy and it it shouldn't be because resistance is a well-known concept you know very well-known concept I do think that um there's a you know, another old and well-known concept is the locus of control. I think it's 1954, Julian Rotter first developed it, 
where if you have an internal locus of no, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll make a bags of this now. If an internal locus of control, you 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 feel in charge of your own happiness. You feel you're steering the ship. You are kind of in control of the outcome of your life in some way. You're managing things. Well, if you've an external locus of control, it's the world, it's your mother and father, it's the government. Outside is the solutions to life. It's external. It's not from within. And, you know, seeking to transition feels like a very external locus of control. It's a, it's a kind of an idea of the solution is outside of me. It's not within me. And it's it doesn't bode well for transitioning because really when, when you've got an internal sense of control, it's so much more empowering. I don't know if the original theory was used in what way, but the way I find this valuable in the work is that an internal locus of control doesn't necessarily mean that you can control the outcome of things, but you can control whether or not you make meaning of something or, yes. or what Sorry. your own level of... No, no, <laughs> right, no that's I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just kind of like how you respond to the world. Yes. And I think you're right that transition feels like an external locus of control. And I guess the reason why is because you're trying to change your exterior to elicit some kind of response from the rest of the world. But I think what, what's even more interesting especially with the young kids, because most kids who I first start working with have not started a medical transition. They're kind of in a social transition place. But even the fixation and obsession with names and pronouns and seeing me as my true self. so external. That is totally external. And so this becomes a very important aspect to work on together in therapy. And there are lots of Lots of ways to do this. I think the platitudes right now is that using someone's pronouns are about respect, right? Yeah. So sometimes I'll say, okay, let me, let me ask you this. If somebody was using your pronouns out of respect, but every time they saw you, they still saw you as your biological sex, how would that land on you? Would that be just as good? Or would that feel kind of like hurtful to you? And we explore that and we talk about that. And it's really crazy. You know, we have these phrases now that are very um, simplistic. Trans women are women. My true and self. They're, they're supposed to, yeah, and they're supposed to circumvent the kind of visceral knowing that we all have. And, you know, I'll tell kids like, if you're sitting at the mall and you're people watching and you see someone who has an androgynous appearance, let's say their hairstyle is androgynous or whatever, do you think most of the time you still know, like deep down inside, if they were, you know, born female or born male? Like, can you tell? And we'll explore that and we'll talk about that. And, you know, I think kids, kids don't want to be lied to. <laughs> And so we discuss the fact that you can't necessarily make somebody see you differently. So if, if I have, let's say I, I fast forward time and I have a young person who, let's say they are transitioning. How can I help bolster their sense of stability? How can you accept the fact that maybe some people will see you as the sex you want to be read and some people won't? So what do you do about that? Can you accept that fact that you may not be read the way you would like all the time? So I think this is a major issue with the affirmation model. It does not take into account the, the very unpredictable nature of living in the real world. You cannot control a passerby on the street, how they see you. And you might get a weird look if you're a trans woman who's like 6'2". You know, how do you help the person be compassionate with themselves if they've been told over and over that pronouns and names are the most important thing. So I don't know. I mean, this is an important issue. What do you think? How does this come up for you? I think it's really interesting because I think young and vulnerable kids have been sold a line that they can control other people's opinions of them. And they can't. And they think they can. And they think they can do that by monitoring the language. But they don't realize you, you can't get into their head and take the thought out. And they might, 
they might say whatever, they might fall in with your names and pronouns, but their thoughts are still ongoing. It reminds me of that lovely quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. And th- they need to take back control. Like the, 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 If they're going to be trans, if they're going to transition, they need to realise, this is for me. This isn't this isn't a, a, a thing that I can control the world and how they, the world sees me. You can't. And that's one of those harsh kind of realities of life. Our ability to control other people's thoughts is pretty limited. And I like to talk about that and about seeking control of other people's thoughts. How, how frustrating a pursuit that is. And you know what I mean? How, oh, how yeah, it's, it's a fool's errand. It, and it, it doesn't really, there's another way to go. And the way to go is self-approval self kind of um satisfaction and that's the way i do as as a concept along the lines of self approval i like working with kids around their style i love the idea and i i often encourage it that the kids organize to go into town with their mates go shopping not with their mother no no not organized that they might even go in on a train or a bus wow how mad is that and they they buy clothes and they figure out their style and they start like we, we, we my seven clients often spend quite some time enjoying their style and figuring out their style and what is their style and what what style what people they like and like I might ask them to find a few people so that I can get an idea of their style I want them to find and they often do they like this some role models and this would be I don't know influencers and stuff like that so I'd look and I go oh I see what you like okay all right okay I get it and it's different styles but to kind of start pursuing a sense of joy not happiness but joy in playing around with your style you're 15 you're 16 whatever about all the pain going on in your life you can mess around with things like earrings and style and bandanas and jackets and things like that. So that's something I like to do. I think you do something around body grounding or body work. Well, I want, I want to just stop and touch on style a bit because what's really interesting, and again, this has so much to do with the arc of a trans identity starting out very rigid and then loosening up. But when kids are first questioning their gender, I find that they're developing their style purely based on what they think it means to be a trans yeah. boy or yeah. a trans yeah. girl. And then over time, what you can start to, to do is say, you know, like you might talk to a kid who says, I really, really love this sweater that I used to wear, but now I don't want to wear it because it'll make me look like I'm not trans or something. And you, you can pull that in and you can say, you know, I, I will say there's there's the five senses and what your five senses like, and then there's the anxious part of your brain that tells you what to like, and those are different. Yeah. I remember a, a girl once said that she loves Britney Spears, but she would never tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, but your ears just like what they like. Why is there so much baggage? You know, but that is the teenage life, right? Yeah. Because to a teenager your image and what group you fall into. I mean, that's everything. But I think it's great to talk about exploring a sense of style. And the the extra layer that I think I add is this body piece, which is like, well, what do your senses like? And if you like this style, what do you like about it? Why do you like it? Um, I, I do try to work with the senses and the body. I mean, I wish I had more expertise and training on this, but I think just based on some of my own experiences and my proclivities, this becomes important. So, you know, I will, I will ask the child to kind of check in with what their visceral self is telling them. And we, we work on the five senses and especially kids who are highly anxious, they tend to have almost like a constant, like ticker tape in their mind of commentary. Yes that makes it hard to actually figure out what they like or what they're enjoying or what they find pleasurable. So this is, um, this is something that I try to tie in and, you know, to think back about the body, I'm aware that you talked about our animalness earlier. And I think a lot of young people that I have worked with 
are terrified of the idea that we're animals. And this kind of ties in, especially for kids who are going through puberty or for young females, that we are regulated by hormonal cascades and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's an existentially terrifying thing, especially if you're used to this digital life that you can curate and you can make your profile exactly as you like and you can decide what photos to post or not post. But the body is not something our mind can control. Yeah, I like to bring in a little bit about the hormonal, uh, more and more and more about just the hormonal impact on a person. I think it's really undis- undiscovered and unacknowledged and it can make a huge impact. I'm going to say our, our favorite sentence. We need to do an episode about <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> That'll be our merch, Sasha. <laughs> but um, about the body groundwork and the kind of the animal like the SSRIs, when, when kids are taking medication, whether it's Ritalin or SSRIs and stuff like that, there is a disconnect. And I know they might need the medication and I'm not a doctor and a massive caveat with all that. But I do find a developing sexuality is stunted by antidepressants and because the, the libido is shot. And I wonder, is there some sort of extra, I, I, this is just a, a half theory I have, but I, I have it more and more often as I meet people, is something along the lines of your, your, your libido is growing when you're in your teen years, then you might take it as some sort of medication that stunts it, stops it, you know, whether it's SSRI or something like that, Ritalin. And then you, 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 you engulf, maybe it's socioculture because everybody around you, their libidos is growing. And so it kind of gets scrambled or warped and it focuses in on your gender because your sexuality is kind of going nowhere. Do do you follow me? And so I like to explore the impact, perhaps, of not having a libido because of medication. And just to say, just raising it up, this could be happening. And how could this kind of be? could, Could your sexuality be subsumed here? And perhaps could it be coming out towards gender as a result. I think that's a fascinating idea. You're kind of saying there is this developmental energy that has to go somewhere. Yeah. And if one avenue is kind of blocked off, it's like, well, where's the detour? Something <laughs> Maybe like it's that. Yeah, gender. it's like I'm chasing a concept there. And I, I think there, you know, it's not as, you know, Michael Biggs and many other people, when they describe what goes on during puberty and stuff, that there, there's a lot of things happening. And it's not just physical development. There's emotional and cognitive development. Puberty is a massive event. And you stop one little part of it, even with puberty blockers or other medication. What else happens? Does everything kind of go slightly out of sync? I don't know. I'm I'm not a doctor. But I I do wonder about things like that. Now, what I like to do in therapy more than anything is, can we just explore that corner of your life? Can we just go into that corner? Just, Just have a route around and look around. Just raise questions, ask a few kind of probing questions, get ourselves thinking about every part so that nothing's taboo and everything is worth a little bit of analysis and exploration. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. This podcast is partially sponsored by RIME, Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics. RIME is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit RethinkIME.org to learn more. If you found value in our show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just go to our link tree. That's linktr.ee slash wider lens pod. Our discussions are for educational purposes only and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services. 